Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. We were up at a cottage last week and had some good family time, but uh, I've missed uh, the last two Sundays, and uh, I've missed preaching, so it is good to be back. Uh, it's good to see Aaron and Chloe here this morning. Welcome, you two, and uh, welcome, Dean. Congratulations to uh, both of you on... Uh, on the new addition to the family, and I was talking to Aaron last night, and he does tell me that the two of them are getting some sleep, so that's a good thing, just give it time. Um, now, we start this little message that I'm going to carry on with this morning on the tribulation period in Matthew chapter 24, and if you have your Bible, uh, I would invite you to turn there now. The pivot point, the, uh, the epicenter of Matthew 24, is verse 21 which says this for then there will be great tribulation so the tribulation is the axle um, on which the rest of this chapter spins and we started talking about this a few weeks ago before I left on holidays the top 10 things you should know about the tribulation so here we go. Number one. Oh, and by the way, there's a little outline in your program. It'll help you follow along. Number one, and we covered this last time. This is just review. The tribulation is going to be preceded by a lot of signs. First, there will be national and international armed conflict. Jesus says that. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Second, there will be localized catastrophes. Jesus says there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Third, hatred for Christ and Christians is going to rise. Verse 9, Jesus said that they will deliver you up to tribulation. They will put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then fourth, there will be apostasy or a falling away in the church and the apostasy will increase. Verse 10, Jesus said that. Many, that means many followers of Jesus, will fall away and betray one another. And they will hate one another. In other words, Christians are going to be at each other's throats. And fifth, false teachers are going to rise up. Jesus said that. Verse 11, many false prophets are going to arise and they will lead many people astray with false teaching. And that's as far as we got last time. So let's carry on. Two more uh, signs in this part and then we'll move on to the second uh, thing you need to know about the tribulation. Here's the sixth sign that will precede the tribulation. The number of disobedient Christians is going to increase. Look at verse 12. Because lawlessness will be increased the love of many, that means many Christians, will grow cold. Lawlessness means that God's law, the Bible, is going to be increasingly neglected, ignored, rejected, and ultimately banned from the culture. That means nobody is going to care about morality anymore. Christians are going to ignore their Bible. They won't read it from one year to the next. And because of that, a lot of Christians then are not going to experience the joy, the peace, the confidence of the Christian life, and they're going to live defeated, cold, loveless lives. And of course, then they're eventually going to get fed up. And Jesus says, the love of many will grow cold. So a loveless relationship with Jesus is like a loveless marriage, miserable. So apparently, those who lose interest and fall away were not truly saved to begin with. Jesus says, verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And then the last sign is a positive sign of the seven signs that will precede uh, the tribulation, global evangelization. In other words, the gospel message is going to infiltrate every nation of the world. Verse 14, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the entire world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And that's happening right now. This is the first generation where 
virtually every country in the world has access to the gospel thanks to technology and satellite uh, technology. The disciples could never have conceived of a time when the gospel would go all over the world. So much of their world was undiscovered and unknown. They could not conceive of a global connectivity and fiber optics and electronic communication. But this is where we are today. And Jesus says, when that happens, then the end will come. And Jesus calls them birth pains, verse 8, contractions. Then they will increase in frequency. They will increase in intensity the closer we get to the tribulation and to Jesus. So this is an appropriate day to be talking about this on Labor Day weekend, of course. So that's the first thing that Jesus tells us about the tribulation. It's going to be preceded by a lot of signs. So let's move on now to the second thing that you should know about the tribulation. Number two, the epicenter, the center of the tribulation is going to be in Jerusalem. The epicenter of an earthquake is the center of the earthquake, the point of origin of the earthquake. Jerusalem is going to be the point of origin of the tribulation. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, there's our word, the holy place, let the reader understand. This verse it's a cryptic verse and requires a little bit of unpacking. Follow carefully here. Matthew inserts this editorial comment. He says, let the reader understand. In other words, pay close attention here. There's hidden gems in this verse, Matthew's saying. First, Jesus mentions the holy place. So the epicenter of the tribulation is going to be in the holy place. Now, where is that? The holy place is a reference to the Jewish temple. Verse 1, at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus had just left the temple. But it's not the same temple that's going to be at the end of time. Because Jesus said in verse 3 that that temple is going to be flattened. It's going to be bulldozed. And it was in 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus said that. An amazing fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic word. So that means that the temple is going to be rebuilt sometime in the future, presumably in the same location in Jerusalem. And Jesus says something called the abomination of desolation is going to stand in it. So the epicenter of the events at the end of the world are going to be located in Israel, in Jerusalem, on this site where the first temple stood and where the new temple is going to stand. Now this is amazing when you consider that at that time, 2,000 years ago, Israel, under the rule of the Roman Empire, was considered a backwater region of the world. No Roman official wanted to go there. You all know about Pilate, the Roman official. He was probably sent there to Judea, to Jerusalem, as punishment because no Roman official wanted to go to Jerusalem. To Rome, it was like Siberia's Russia. So Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities in the world. It's been destroyed at least twice. It's been besieged 23 times. It's been attacked 52 times. And it's been captured and recaptured 44 times. When Jesus said this, nobody would have believed that at the end of the age, the eyes of the world would be on this corner of the world. In fact, before 1948, to suggest that the defining events that would shape the world in the future are going to originate from this spot in Jerusalem would have been very, very difficult to believe. After 70 AD, the Jewish people were kicked out of Israel when the Roman military might turned on them like a pack of mad dogs. They became displaced people all over the world with no homeland. Israel was a wasteland. Then one afternoon in 1948, 
Israel was given back to the Jewish people and it became a nation again as a result of a vote one afternoon at the newly formed United Nations Conference. And the words in Isaiah 50, 66 verse 8 came true. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in a day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? Yes, it can. And it did. And then Isaiah says, As soon as Zion, or Israel, was in labor, she brought forth her children. And that's exactly what has been happening for the last 60 odd years. The eyes of the world have been on Israel ever since, since 1948. Jerusalem is Israel's capital city, and yet it is such a political hot potato that virtually no country in the world publicly recognizes Jerusalem today as the capital of Israel. That's why the world's embassies are all located in Tel Aviv. Bill Clinton and George Bush both supported moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, but only Trump had the will to do it, and he did it just a few months ago. The most politically sensitive piece of real estate on the planet today is this exact spot where the temple was located. Today, the Temple Mount, as, as that location is called, is owned by the Muslims. And it's the location of the Dome of the Rock, as it's called, the Muslim Mosque. And it's the most recognizable piece of real estate in the world. You look at any picture of the skyline of Jerusalem, and that gold domed roof pops out of the picture. No Jewish person today is allowed to set foot on the Temple Mount. I was in Jerusalem a few years ago and with 25 other pastors and we got access to a lot of restricted areas where cruise ship passengers could never go but the one place that we could not go was this Temple Mount because our guides were Jewish. And even though it is in the heart of Jerusalem, the Israeli capital city, the Prime Minister of Israel can't even walk on the Temple Mount. Back in 1967, during a summit conference with other world leaders, the Israeli Prime Minister went out for a stroll, and I suppose he wanted to see what would happen if he walked up there. And when he set foot on the Temple Mount, he nearly set off World War III. Israel is the only country in the world with a capital city, with a piece of real estate that the leader of the nation is prohibited from treading on. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus identified the epicenter of the tribulation and the end of the world right here in Jerusalem, the most politically sensitive region of the world in the most politically sensitive nation of the world, in the most politically sensitive city in the world, on the most politically sensitive piece of real estate in the world. The tribulation is going to have its epicenter in Jerusalem. Third thing you should know about the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to dominate it. Now everybody agrees, I would imagine, that the world needs something. The world's in a mess. The world needs a savior. And the world is going to increasingly recognize its need for a savior. And the tribulation period is going to give rise to somebody that the world is going to recognize and embrace as its savior. And the savior that it's going to embrace is going to be the Antichrist. The Antichrist simply means that he will be anti-Christ. He will be the diametrical polar opposite of Christ. Jesus is the God-man. God in a physical body, the Antichrist, is going to be Satan in a physical body. Satan incarnate. Satan is going to be manifest in the form of a man. 
Just the way Jesus came to earth to do God's will, the Antichrist is going to come to earth to do the will of Satan. Now let's keep unpacking. Look at verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, in the temple. Now notice some things here. First, the abomination of desolation is a person or a thing. Notice it's tangible, physical, visible. Jesus says, when you see standing in the holy place. Secondly, as we said, the temple is going to be rebuilt. The Holy of Holies will once again symbolize God's presence with the people of Israel. The Jewish priesthood is going to be reestablished. The sacrificial system is going to be reinstituted. Passover lambs are going to be sacrificed on the ceremonial altar once again in the future. Third, the abomination of desolation is going to be a profoundly offensive action towards the Jewish people in the most politically sensitive city on the most politically sensitive property on the planet in the most holy Jewish religious site on the planet. It's going to be something horrendous. It's, it's going to be something catastrophically offensive. It is going to be something that is so explosive that it is quite capable of sparking World War III. Fourthly, Here's the most critical observation about verse 15. The abomination of desolation was described by the Old Testament prophet Daniel. Jesus says that in verse 15. Spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So in order to get more information about the abomination of desolation, we have to go back to Daniel and consult Daniel. The abomination of desolation is mentioned by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, written 600 years earlier. So flip over there in your Bible. If you can't find Daniel, go to the front of your Bible, to the table of contents, look for Daniel, and then look for the page number and you'll find the book of Daniel. Go over to Daniel chapter 9. Now if Matthew chapter 24 is the power train of the biblical prophetic texts, Daniel 9 is the backbone of biblical prophecy. So let's walk through the relevant text in Daniel 9. I want to show you some very helpful and interesting things here. Now we're going to take our time because I don't want anybody to be left behind, so to speak. I want to help you to see this. Now, that's why Matthew says, let the reader understand. In other words, read carefully. I'm going to show you here that the abomination of desolation is the Antichrist. Daniel 9, beginning in verse 26. To the end, there shall be war. So that sets this prophecy at the end of time. And that's consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew 24 about wars and rumors of wars. Now the end of Matthew, uh, Daniel 29, verse 26 says this. Desolations are decreed. There's our word, desolations. Verse 27. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wings of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. There's our words again, the abomination of desolation. Until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So this is the exact passage that Jesus is referencing in Matthew 24. Now we learn a few things about the abomination of desolation from Daniel chapter 9. First, he is a person. Notice the pronoun. He shall make. He shall put shall come one. So he's a person. Secondly, he's going to be a world leader. He's going to achieve peace with Israel in the Middle East. Look what Daniel says. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. A covenant is an agreement. Uh, it's a peace treaty. Uh, the word many there signifies that this covenant is going to have massive influence. 
for one week. Now, one week does not sound very impressive for a peace treaty. A one-week peace accord doesn't sound very strong. Now follow this. One week here does not mean a literal seven days. It's symbolic. The word week there literally means seven. The interpreters have supplied the word week. Literally means seven. But that begs the question, seven what? Seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years? That's what... Um, the context makes it clear that the seven is referring to seven years. That's what most commentators understand it to mean. And I'll come back to this in the next message when we come back to this. So it's going to be a seven-year peace agreement. And this person is going to set up a new round of peace talks. He's going to accomplish something that no other world leader has ever been able to achieve, though many have tried. He's going to negotiate a peace accord with Israel, and he's going to bring peace to the Middle East, and he's going to bring it something that is bulletproof, a strong covenant, it says. It's going to be an ironclad covenant. He's going to broker peace in the Middle East, and that is what will boost this world leader's brand. It will be an amazing display of his power and his influence and wisdom. The first world leader ever to broker an ironclad peace covenant in the Middle East. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Third, then he's going to betray Israel. Daniel says, and for half of the week, again, the word seven, for half of the seven, he shall put an end to sacrifice an offering. Now what's that mean? Well, sacrifice and offering was done in the temple. There's the temple again, right at the center of all of this activity. The temple that Jesus said in Matthew 24 that's going to be destroyed. So it's going to be rebuilt. That means the temple will be rebuilt. It means the sacrificial system is going to be reinstituted. And it is going to be at the epicenter of the tribulation just like Jesus said it would. Just the way Daniel said it would. And at the three and a half year mark, halfway through this seven year period, he's going to betray the Jewish people. He's going to breach the terms of the covenant. And he's going to abolish Daniel's says, the re-established Jewish sacrificial system. Now that is going to be part of the offensive nature of the abomination of desolation. And this is where the wheels are going to fall off in the middle of the tribulation. And an amazing display of scriptural cohesion, the book of Revelation mentions the same three and a half year period. For example, Revelation 11 verse 2 says, they will trample the holy city, Jerusalem, for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Verse, chapter 11 verse 3 says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days, three and a half years. Revelation 12, 6 mentions 1260 days, three and a half years. And then fourthly, the Apostle Paul describes this same event in 2 Thessalonians 2. Listen to this, verse 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, let nobody deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Remember, one of the signs that will precede the tribulation, Jesus mentioned, is a spirit of lawlessness. So the man of lawlessness is going to rise to power in an age when the spirit of lawlessness is rampant all over the world. That makes sense. The spirit of the age produces leaders who are a product of that age. He's the man of lawlessness. And that's why he's called the Antichrist. Because he's the diametrical opposite of Jesus. Because he's the polar opposite of God's righteous, perfect law. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. In other words, Jesus is the only perfect man who has ever lived. The Antichrist is a man of lawlessness and he hates God's law. Still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul goes on. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, the Antichrist, and here's the ultimate blasphemy, so he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. 
There's the unthinkable abomination. That's why Jesus was crucified, by the way. Because they said he was blaspheming by claiming to be God. The difference between Jesus and the Antichrist is that Jesus really was God. But the Antichrist is also going to claim to be God. He's going to stand in the holy place, in the temple, and he's going to desecrate the Jewish religious system, and he's going to wipe out the sacrificial system that is going to be reinstituted, and he's going to declare himself to be God, and he's going to demand the worship of the world. And here's the ultimate contrast with Jesus. Remember when Jesus went into the temple, and he cleared it out with a wee cord, a wee whip? A piece of string, really, is all it was. In that action, Jesus was rejecting the Jewish religious system when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. Remember that? And he did that because of love. And they rejected their Messiah. It's going to happen again. There's going to come a day when the temple is going to be desecrated by Satan in a body because of hate. Revelation 13 calls him the beast and tells us four things about him. First, he will be Satan incarnate. Listen to what it says Revelation 13. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed to exercise supreme authority for 42 months. There's the three and a half years again. Second, he will command authority over a global military alliance, kind of a, an unholy United Nations force. Verse 7 in Revelation 13 says, It was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. So he's got military power. And authority was given him over every tribe, people, nation, and language. Third, he's going to be worshipped globally. Verse 8 says, all who dwell on earth will worship him. Everybody whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. And then verse 15 describes how that's going to happen. It's probably electronic imagery because probably big screen TVs or jumbotron type images. How else are people all over the world going to be able to worship the Antichrist because he's not omnipresent, he cannot be more than one place at a time. Notice the repeated use of the word, the term image, verse 15. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And then fourthly, he's going to control a one currency, cashless global economy. Verse 16, he will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave. In other words, everybody is going to be on the grid to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that nobody can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. So the Antichrist is going to dominate the global economy and he will dominate the tribulation. Now, we're out of time. So we'll pick this up next time, a couple of weeks' time, a uh, week after the retreat, I suppose. But let me finish this way. If you have ever struggled with doubt about the Bible, ever feared the future, ever questioned the promises of the Bible, ever wondered if it's all true, if God's really there, if God really cares, if, if Jesus' words in Matthew 20, Jesus' words in Matthew 24 will strengthen your faith. Jesus said to the disciples in the boat one day in a storm, Why do you fear, O oh, you of little faith? There is a direct correlation between fear and lack of faith. When I entertain doubts about the Bible and about the existence of Jesus and God, I fear. It causes me to fear all sorts of things. But when I get answers to my questions and doubts that spring from doubt, my faith strengthens and I, and I have no problem with fear. Because strong faith is the foundation of everything else. 
And so no matter what you're worried about today, what, no matter what you need help with today, if you'll trust Him, I promise you, He'll help you. The Bible is not a prissy, dusty, Sunday school textbook. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a book written by mere men. It is God's holy word. Written by men writing what God told them to write. You can take it to the bank. Everything it says is true. Every promise, every instruction, every principle, everything that it says about the magnificence, the majesty, the glory, the wonder, the beauty of Jesus is all absolutely, perfectly true. You can admire Jesus and follow Him and love Him and obey Him and He becomes the most important person in your life. Because he's real and he's true. Matthew 24 can convince you of all of that. And when you believe this book, well, you will sleep well at night. Let's pray. Father, if there is one person here today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, who is not sure that they're ready to die, that they're not sure if they're forgiven, are filled with fear for the future, not sure if they're going to heaven, Father, please, right now, this moment, give them faith to trust Christ right now, to believe in Christ, because your word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, forgiven, heaven bound. Father, for those of us who trust Christ, may that trust produce peace and confidence and joy and love and patience and grace and hope and kindness in our spirit. And may other people see it in us and be drawn to Christ because of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.